Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I hope you can hear me clearly. So I just have a couple of small announcements before we begin. Next week, we have both St. Luke Reads. We have Bryn Turnbull, the author of The Paris Deception, coming on Thursday, 6.30 p.m., and she will be launching her book. We will also have music and a reception and some live jazz. We also have our annual book sale coming up on the 22nd and the 21st, as people have been requesting. We also have, at the end of the month, Judith Cohen's Songs and Stories of the Sephardim on the 25th at 2 p.m. and our bonsai exhibit as well on the 22nd. So on your way out, do pick up a highlights paper so that you know everything that's going on. October is super busy because it is also Public Libraries Week this month. And now without further ado, here is Dr. Joe Schwartz. That was not actually a bodiless voice. There is a body. Out there. <laughs> All right, what do we have to start with today? Come on. What happened today? The Nobel Prize, of course. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine Physiology awarded today. It was not a surprise. Uh, the betting had been that uh, Kathleen Corico and Andrew Weissman would be the recipients for developing the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, actually, it was surprising that uh, it wasn't awarded to them last year, but uh, the Nobel Prize is not necessarily awarded for something current. There's a big backlog, you know, of, of uh, it's, not, it's not uncommon for someone to win the Nobel Prize for research that was done 20 or 30 years uh, earlier. But uh, this is, is something like that because the contribution that these two made goes back to about 2005. That's when their work on messenger RNA uh, started. Uh, to award a Nobel Prize is a very complicated business because it kind of infers that the recipient uh, is the only one that is deserving in that particular area. And that's not the case. It is certainly not the case this time. There have been hundreds, really hundreds of people involved over the years in messenger RNA research. And uh, all of them made incremental contributions. You know, it, it goes back to, to Isaac Newton, uh, when he was asked about how he had come, made so many discoveries, he said, it's because I stood on the shoulder of giants. And that really is how discoveries get made. It is very, very rare that there is, you know, one real breakthrough moment. There are many moments that eventually end up to get a whole picture. However, there are some steps where you can say that Without that step, there would not have been the same degree of, of progress. And that is the, uh, that's the case uh, uh, this time with the awarding of the Nobel Prize to uh, Kathleen Carrico and, and Andrew Weissman. They made a very significant contribution in designing the messenger RNA so that it can get into a cell and do what it has to do. So what does it have to do? What is, what is the basic idea of a vaccine. In order to, to have vaccine efficacy, what you need to do is to train the body to recognize a foreign material and have an issue with it, try to neutralize it. So what you have to do in this particular case is introduce a piece of the COVID virus so that the body learns to recognize that piece engage against it so that the next time it meets up with the virus, it can battle it, it can neutralize it. Now, we've all seen pictures of the COVID-19 uh, virus, which has these little spike proteins, as they're called, on the surface. Well, that is the protein that the virus uses to 
enter a cell. It's like the key that unlocks its entry into the cell. The whole idea behind the COVID-19 vaccine is to introduce a piece of that spike protein into the system so that the body learns to produce antibodies against it. So that the next time, if it meets up with the virus, which has that protein on it, it will recognize it and neutralize it. And of course, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the basic idea. However, how do you get the body to generate a little bit of that spike protein so that it learns to produce antibodies to it? Well, the way you do that is by introducing this molecule called messenger RNA, which really is a template for making proteins. But the real difficulty is to get the body not to develop an immunological reaction against that protein when you're introducing it. Because all you want is for the body to generate antibodies against the potential virus, but you don't want to trigger some kind of inflammatory reaction with the vaccine. And what their contribution was, which was a very significant one, was to find a way to modify the messenger RNA so that the body doesn't recognize it as a foreign invader. And that was really a key step in uh, making the vaccine. Uh, the first company, of course, to do it was Moderna, and the name itself is from modified RNA. That's where Moderna comes in. And it is these two who made that modification in the design of the RNA molecule that allowed it to uh, to work. So anyway, that's the the um, the story of of the Nobel Prize, <clears throat> and. It could have gone to some others in, in the process as well. Uh, a Canadian at University of, of British Columbia was the one who basically designed the, the fatty acid molecules that encapsulate this messenger protein when it's introduced to prevent it from being broken down in the bloodstream. He could have include, been included in the Nobel Prize too, and, and the betting actually was that he would be included because the Nobel Prize can go to three people at the same time. It wasn't, so I don't know what the discussions would have been. But there are many others who had who made significant contributions. But it's pretty well accepted in the scientific community that, that this is a highly justified Nobel Prize because they really did make that significant contribution. Uh, Kathleen Carrico is an interesting person. I, I've spoken to her several times because she's Hungarian. So I became interested in her years ago. Uh, she actually left Hungary still during the communist era in the 80s when it was not easy to, to leave. And uh, they actually had a used car in Hungary, uh, she and her husband, and she had a small baby at the time. They sold that car to have some money to get out. And uh, you weren't allowed to take money out of Hungary at that time. So they put the money into a teddy bear and they sold it in there and the kid carried the, the money and they uh, they got to the States. She struggled at University of Pennsylvania as sort of a fringe researcher for a while uh, because her work wasn't really accepted. It took you know years and years and essentially COVID is what brought it into the uh, limelight. So... Um, there it is, that's the Nobel Prize. The, the uh, prize money this year is one point something million, uh, which they the two of them will share. But they've, they've won a bunch of other prizes already, so they're not wanting for money. And of course, she also works for the company that makes the, uh, the vaccine. So uh, obviously, you know, uh, pretty well off, but it's, it isn't about the money. Anyway, it's interesting that this came out today because, as you know, you probably know, the topic that I want to talk about today is biotechnology. And, I mean, this is a, a classic example of biotechnology, which is really the use of living systems to produce useful substances for humankind. Anyway, all right, let's get down to, to, to this topic. First of all, I mean, if we're going to talk about biotechnology. 
we have to understand what is meant by the term technology. Right? We use it all the time, but what does it really mean? Uh, it is the application of science or scientific principles to something that is useful in everyday life. I mean, that's pretty simple. We use this all the time. When, uh, when we're looking at something that is made of steel, that, of course, is technology. When we're looking at uh, uh, space travel, I mean, that is application of scientific principles there, uh, computer technology, surgery, all of this, of course, is uh, absolutely an example of, uh, of technology. But what about biotechnology? Well, in this case, we are just using living systems, which, which can be humans, animals, plants, fungi, uh, bacteria, to see whether or not we can harness something about their existence to the benefit of mankind or womankind. For example, Botox. You might not think of this as being an example of biotechnology, but it is a typical example of biotechnology. What is Botox? Botox is a substance that is isolated from a bacterium. Clostridium botulinum is a bacterium. It produces a toxin called Botox, which is one of the most toxic substances that exists. Keep that in mind when you hear the stupid talk about everything natural being safe and benign and synthetics being dangerous. Nature is what is really dangerous. But it is all a question of how you use it. When this stuff is extracted from the bacterium and used as a cosmetic procedure to essentially paralyze muscles, that's what it does. That's how it reduces wrinkles by paralyzing uh, the muscles. You're using biotechnology because the bacterium is a living system. So whatever it produces, which is then turned to beneficial use is basically uh, biotechnology or uh, something else in your everyday life. If you look at your detergents that you use in your washing machine and look at the list of ingredients, you'll see it shows enzymes. Well, enzymes are just very special protein molecules that acts as catalyst. This can be very important when you're breaking down stains, which are either made of fats or, or proteins or sugars, and enzymes can do that. So for example, when you look at your, your Tide, you'll see on the label that it contains enzymes. Enzymes are just very large protein molecules. Lipases, for example, break down fats. So if you have a grease stain, that's a fatty material, you need to break it down into little pieces that are soluble that, that of course, can be rinsed away. Well, these uh, lipases are isolated from bacteria or from fungi or from yeast. And as you can imagine, they have tremendous commercial value because of, of uh, obviously, in the laundry industry, they can remove your stains. But this is really biotechnology because we're using an extract of some sort of living system to do something for us. These days, of course, there's a lot of talk about um, plastics and the fact that they clutter up the environment and they're not biodegradable. Well, there's a type of plastic that is made from polylactic acid. Uh, very often, of course, they will not let you forget that, made from plants, which is a, a bit of a, a stretch. Polylactic acid is made from glucose, and glucose can be isolated from plants. It uh, can come from corn or from cornstarch. However, there are many, many steps in between getting the glucose out of cornstarch and converting it to polylactic acid, which is, is used in the making of, of these uh, cups. And it is true that these are biodegradable. However, there's an asterisk beside that. Uh, if you take this, one of these polylactic acid glasses, and you know they're sold now all the time, advertises biodegradable. 
I can tell you, you can leave this out in your backyard for years and nothing is going to happen to it. But if you put it into an industrial composting facility, then it will be broken down. Why? Well, that's biotechnology too. Because why do composting facilities work? How do they work? It's microbes, bacteria, and fungi that break down the material. But that has to be done in a pretty well-controlled way. You need the right temperature. The compost has to be turned often enough so that it's exposed to, to the air. So while it is literally true that this thing is biodegradable, it is only biodegradable under the right conditions. But anyway, it is biotechnology. So is raising corn to produce alcohol, which can be blended with gasoline for the car. That is also biotechnology, right? You're growing corn. Obviously, it is a living species. You extract the corn starch from it. You break that down with enzymes to glucose, and the glucose can be fermented to produce alcohol. The alcohol can be blended with gasoline. And you can blend about 10 to 15% ethanol with gasoline without having to modify your engine. And that is being done. We are burning uh, alcohol together with the gasoline. You can also modify an engine so that it uh, burns only alcohol. And uh, that is done in Brazil. Most of the cars in Brazil are powered purely by ethanol. There are ethical considerations with that. If you're growing corn to produce ethanol for energy, then you think about whether or not that corn could instead have been used to feed starving people. A third of the world goes to bed hungry every night. So these, you know, there are ethical questions uh, about this, about using plant material for energy instead of for food. Anyway, biotechnology obviously plays an important role in our life, as you say. And it's always interesting to take a look at history. As, you know, as has been so often said, if you don't know where you've been, it's pretty hard to figure out where you're going. You can learn from history. And if you don't learn from history, you're condemned to repeat it. And, you know, I don't have to point out specifics where, you know, we're seeing right now history being uh, repeated. So in terms of biotechnology, we can go back thousands of years. Fermentation is a key process, which just means that you are going to use some sort of microorganism to do a job for us. In this case, the job is to take mostly sugars, break them down into more useful substances. And we can go back thousands of years. I mean, one of the first reactions, which is obviously a reaction that involves biotechnology, is the fermentation of grapes to make wine. Grapes are living things. And you have yeasts, that are present on the surface of the grape, yeast is also a living organism. So when the yeast reacts with the sugar in the, uh, in the grape, uh, of course, the result is that you get ethanol. Ethanol is the alcohol that we can drink. It, of course, is also the alcohol that I just mentioned, which can be used to, to power our cars. The chemical reaction is a straightforward one. Glucose, that's the C6H1206, it's broken down by yeast to give you ethanol and uh, carbon dioxide. But what happens if you leave that wine open to the air and you store it for a while? What happens to it? it turns it to vinegar, right? But why does that happen? Because after you've done your alcoholic fermentation and you produce ethanol, Bacteria, which are always present in the air, can get into the wine. And those bacteria are so-called lactobacilli, and they produce an acid, 
lactic acid, which then converts this into acetic acid, and that is vinegar. So when you see um, wine vinegar, and there are many different kinds of uh, wine vinegar, that then, of course, is done on purpose. So then you take wine, and on purpose, you add bacteria of the lactobacilli family to convert the uh, ethanol into acetic acid. But of course, you still have some of the grape components there to give you the added flavor. So that's why there are all of these different kinds of uh, wine vinegar, which basically you put on your salad, or you cook with it, et cetera. But it doesn't have to be from wine. You can also do this from apple juice. You can ferment apple juice. It becomes apple cider. And then if you add the lactobacilli to the apple cider, you get apple cider vinegar. You've probably heard about this because uh, you see ads all over the place about the benefits of apple cider vinegar. It's supposed to do everything. Helps to lose weight, controls your blood glucose, helps your hair become shiny, etc. Well, uh, I, I suppose if you put vinegar in your hair, it might make it a little bit shiny because it removes the, the grease. Uh, but the other claims here are really uh, not supported by evidence, uh, except for the fact that these days, you know, if you scrutinize the scientific literature, you can always find a single paper to prove anything that you want to prove because there's just so much stuff published, a lot of it garbage, but nevertheless, it gets published. Uh, but, you know, if, uh, if you want to pick and choose, you can always find something to basically bolster any point of view that you may have. So you can go through the scientific literature and find a paper which says something about apple cider vinegar and weight management, where they did show some benefit, taking two spoonfuls of apple cider vinegar with, with, with a meal. But then you also find out that in this study, they, these people already were on a calorie-restricted diet. So what is doing it? Is the calorie restriction or is it the apple cider vinegar? Anyway, I don't think that there's much use for apple cider vinegar except to put it on your salad if you want to improve the taste of, of the salad. Uh, but, you know, uh, as I've told you before, the more claims you see being made for some product, the less likely that any of them are true. That's a pretty good rule of thumb because this is just not how things work. You don't put something into your body that, that affects diverse systems. All right, continuing in history, we go back to Mesopotamia where um, by about 6,000 BC, they were very much aware of fermentation. They were drinking wine, they were drinking beer, but they were also making bread, but they were making bread that would rise. Now that was a new development. Making bread goes back historically way before this time. It goes back to about 10, 12,000 BC. It was interesting, you know, we say 10, 12,000 BC, you know, as a, a thousand years didn't matter. I mean, it's, you know, but of course we, we just don't know exactly uh, when. But the earliest breads were what today we would call flat breads. And so they would just take some grains, grind, grind them up, mix it with, with water, put it in the oven and, and bake it. And those were the flat breads. But the Mesopotamian contribution about 6,000 years ago was the observation that if you took grains and you ground them up and mixed them with water and let it sit around, which they probably did by accident, then you began to see the water form bubbles. Now that, of course, probably would have intrigued them. Wow. Well, today, of course, we know what's going on here because the grains naturally contain various yeast and bacteria, and those will produce carbon dioxide along with alcohol and some acids, as we just saw before. And when you produce carbon dioxide, that, of course, is a gas. And that is what causes the dough to rise. So what really we had here was what we would call 
a sourdough starter. Why sour? Because the acids that are produced in this fermentation have a sour taste. So 6,000 years ago, they were making bread rice like this. It's a natural phenomenon. It just relies on capturing the naturally occurring bacteria or yeast from the air or which are already present in, in the grain. And the bread rises. And of course, what that would have been is sourdough bread, which obviously we still have today. It's the tastiest bread that you can have. And we know that the ancient Egyptians were also familiar with this idea of fermented dough. How do we know that? What is the classic story that? What biblical story would prove that? <laughs> the Passover story, right? You remember the Passover story? Yes? When Yul Brynner <laughs> said to Charlton Heston, take your people and go. You remember that? Okay. Well, they left so quickly that they didn't have time to allow the bread to rise. So, of course, they ate the unleavened bread, which is what we call matzah. So, whether you believe the, the theological connections in the Bible or not, we know that the Bible was written a long time ago. So they were obviously aware of the idea of um, uh, rising uh, dough. <clears throat> Fermentation reactions are interesting, not only in, in, in making alcohol, in making bread, but also in making things like kimchi which is becoming very popular these days because uh, of the emphasis on fermented foods being uh, probiotics. Anyway, kimchi uh, goes back to Korea about 3000 BC, right? So that's about 5,000 years ago. Well, what is it? Uh, kimchi is the product of uh, bacterial fermentation. And what they did was to mix together vegetables like cabbage, pepper, uh, garlic, ginger, radishes, sugar, green onion, and you let this sit. And thanks to, again, bacteria, yeast, and fungi that are present in the environment, they would slowly act upon the carbohydrates in these foods, generate some carbon dioxide, so you'd see some bubbling, generate some alcohol, and generate a whole range of acids, which give it sort of a tart uh, flavor. Traditionally, the kimchi was made in these containers called ungi. And um, they were made of ceramic. They would pile all the vegetables in there and just let it sit until it would eventually ferment. And this is something that uh, is still done today. I mean, this is Korea's national dish, but it has become very popular here as well because it contains a whole bunch of bacteria which uh, are said to squeeze out disease-causing bacteria from the gut, right? They, all the bacteria, we have all kinds of bacteria in our gut, but they all vie for the same food supply. And the... Uh, Lactobacilli that are, are produced here are not disease causing, but they will multiply and take away the food supply from the potentially disease causing bacteria. Now, this is um, such an important national food in Korea, kimchi, that when the first Korean astronaut went into space 2008, well, Korea doesn't have its own launch vehicles. She went aboard a Soyuz, a, a, a Russian a space vehicle. But uh, the Korean government decided that if a Korean astronaut was going into space, she had to go with kimchi. And they spent two years of research to come up with what came to be called space kimchi. Why did they have to do so much research? Because... You couldn't have continued fermentation inside of the space station. Uh, 
You don't want your kimchi all of a sudden blowing up because of the carbon dioxide and pieces floating all over the uh, the station. So what they did was they made the kimchi, then they sterilized it with gamma radiation, so it no longer had any living organisms in it. And she took the space kimchi up with her and treated her Russian colleagues to a Korean dinner. So uh, kimchi is obviously a product of uh, biotechnology. Well, who discovered all of this? That microbes are responsible for this process we call fermentation, the breakdown of, of carbohydrates into useful materials. Uh, again, there are many people who made contributions to this. It's not a discovery that was made from one minute to the other. I mean, you know, you you bring up the idea of fermentation and, you know, pose a question, well, who discovered it? I mean, you'll immediately get the name Louis Pasteur, okay? Well, Pasteur, of course, as you'll see, did play an important role, but he couldn't have done what he did without what was already known, what the predecessors had done. And there were a lot of predecessors. For example, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, a, a Dutch astronomer, really, uh, who made telescopes, and he also made the first microscope. It didn't look the way that you think that it looks. I mean, we all have sort of an image, right, of what microscopes should look like. The first microscope ever made looked quite different. Mm -hmm. This is the first microscope ever. It had a very small lens. And whatever you were going to look at would be put on the end of a pin. And then you would hold it up and look through the, the lens. And it had, you know, remarkable magnifying power. I mean, nothing, of course, compared to, to today's microscopes. But it would magnify something like 25 times, which is enough to see some microbes in, in saliva or, or in water. And Leeuwenhoek did see those. And he even drew pictures of them. And he called them animalcules because they were moving around. He looked at his saliva uh, and he saw these things moving around. To him, it looked like little animals. Well, you know, in a sense, he wasn't totally wrong because what he was looking at were bacteria. Now, bacteria aren't really animals, but they are living species and they do move around. So he was the first one to look at microorganisms. Now, Pasteur, of course, uh, is a very important player in, in this game. Uh, Pasteur, by training, was a chemist. And that's something that, that uh, very often doesn't get said. The biologists and the physicians try to steal him. But uh, he was trained as a chemist. He always considered himself uh, uh, to be one. His fame comes from his studies on fermentation. Now, as I described to you, fermentation was known for thousands of years as an observation. I mean, people knew that if you took grape juice, it would change into wine. But of course, they didn't really know how that was happening. It was really Pasteur who explained this. And he, of course, already was aware of the existence of microbes because he knew about Leeuwenhoek and by Pasteur's time, of course, microscopes also had been improved. But here was his experiment. And this is one of the most critical experiments in the history of the world. And it's so simple. Pasteur took some bean broth. He boiled it. By this time, they knew that these microbes or these animalcules that had been noted, if you heat them, they don't move anymore. They die. I mean, bacteria are killed by heat. Fungi are killed by heat. All microbes are killed by heat. So he took some beef broth, he boiled it in a flask that essentially was sealed with a glass tube in that shape. And he waited and he waited and nothing happened in that container. However, when he repeated the same experiment, he boiled the beef broth, 
but he detached the long tube and he waited and looked to the microscope and there were these microbes again frolicking and moving around. Where did they come from? They had to have come from the air because that was the only difference. So this proved that there were living things in the air that could carry out such reactions. Well, one of these living things was a yeast that today we call Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this uh, also is known as baker's yeast. And this is the stuff today that is used to make most commercial breads. When you go into a supermarket and you see these foul things that they call bread, <laughs> uh, these are made using baker's yeast. And they have this spongy, vile consistency. Right. But if you want real bread with taste and texture, then you have to be looking at good old fashioned sourdough bread. If you've ever been to San Francisco, you know that they produce outstanding sourdough bread. Why is it called sourdough? Again, because it has some uh, acid remnants in it. That's what gives it the, the taste. Um, baker's yeast doesn't add any flavor. Baker's yeast just produces carbon dioxide. So it does cause the dough to rise. So you can make bread with it. But when you're doing sourdough, remember what I told you, you know what happens is that the microbes produce all kinds of other chemicals besides carbon dioxide. They produce ethanol, they produce acids, and a whole range of other things. So that's what gives it the flavor. Do you have to go to San Francisco to get sourdough bread? No, you can go to Monkland. <laughs> and you can go to the Minnery Urban, which is on, on Monkland. They produce outstanding sourdough breads. And they use uh, traditional methods. Uh, there's no brewer's yeast there. It's all proper microbial fermentation. Um, but you'll have to open up your bank account. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's expensive, but uh, it really is worth it. Sourdough breads differ in taste. They can differ greatly in taste. And that has been explored. There was this fascinating study where they took sourdough starter, the same sourdough starter, and sent it to chefs in different places in the world and asked them to bake bread with that starter. Well, it turned out that the breads had quite different tastes. They're all good. They're all sourdough bread, but they were different. What was the cause? Well, it turns out that we all have microbes in our body. We have bacteria in our hands. So some of these bacteria from the bakers gets transferred to the dough and it becomes a, all part of the starter and it causes different flavors. So it depends what kind of starter you have. And these days you can buy sourdough starter, which basically is just made by taking grains, moistening the grain and waiting until you get a little fermentation. And uh, making sourdough bread at home became very popular during COVID. People you know, needed something to do. Who here makes sourdough bread at home? No one. <laughs> You buy the supermarket crap. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you, you gotta you, you you gotta treat your sourdough starter like a baby. You have to take good care of it. Every day you have to add a little bit of water to it. Uh, make sure it doesn't get exposed to too much cold or to too much heat. Uh, there are all kinds of sourdough starters, though, you can buy. This one, Yukon sourdough starter, this is interesting. 
Why should we associate sourdough with the Yukon? That's because the uh, gold miners, who of course went up to the Yukon to search for gold, they used to take along a sourdough uh, starter so that they could make bread out you know, in, in, in the countryside. And there's one. You can see that he made a big loaf of sourdough bread. It was probably very good. Uh, there was even uh, a hotel called the Sourdough. And they would uh, serve sourdough pancakes. And if you go up to the Yukon or to Alaska now, that's always the specialty for breakfast is the sourdough. And they have sourdough bread in, in, in the stores. And interesting enough, Robert Service uh, had uh, a book called so Songs of the Sourdough because these gold prospectors were called sourdough because they ate sourdough. Well, you don't want to have bread without sometimes having some cheese with it. Well, that, of course, is also a product of biotechnology. Again, we go back thousands of years here to an accidental observation. Some nomad sometime carried animal milk in a bag made from the stomach of an animal. This was long before bottles. It was long before Tupperware. Okay, uh, so how did they carry around any kind of liquid? The bags were made from the stomach of an animal. And while this nomad was traveling, carrying milk in this bag, when he opened it, he found that the milk had turned solid. He had made cheese. What's going on here? Well, biotechnology because there are enzymes in the stomach of a calf collectively called rennet. And it is the rennet that curdles the milk. It causes the casein, which is a type of protein in the milk, to precipitate. So every time now that you eat cheese, you are using biotechnology or using the fruits of biotechnology. But one of the most interesting areas where certainly biotechnology has made uh, great advances is in the pharmaceutical industry. Dr. William Osler, credited for saying this, this uh, desire to take medicine, perhaps the greatest feature which distinguishes man from animals. This is in numerous textbooks about uh, uh, pharmacology. Uh, no one could really explain what it meant, what he meant by this. Uh, because there are many other things that distinguish you know, humans from the animals. But anyway, uh, obviously we do rely on, on uh, pharmaceuticals and there is biotechnology interestingly in, in, involved here. I mean, the history of drugs is a very interesting one. And I mean, of course we can talk about that in detail some other time, but most drugs have been discovered historically through trial and error or some sort of lucky accident. So for example, opium, uh, which of course uh, is the juice of the poppy and it contains morphine. And thousands of years ago, they would have learned that consuming this poppy juice could relieve pain. Because let's face it, in those days, what could they try if someone was in pain, feeling sick, what could you try except to try to eat something? So they would have tried all kinds of, of, of plant products, and we have evidence for that. Here's an ancient Sumerian tablet, and there's no question that this medicine man is carrying poppies. Well, why would he have been carrying poppies? Because of course they were aware of this. But this would have happened over many, many, many years. And who knows how many people died by eating all kinds of poisonous plants. But then you learn not to eat those and that you use the ones that may have some benefit. For example, the autumn crocus turned out to be beneficial for gout, or the bark of the white willow tree has a pain reliever in it called salicin, and it has some chemical similarity to, to aspirin, or digitalis, which is extracted from the foxglove, and it is used for treatment of congestive heart, heart failure or to reduce uh, risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation. 
And this was already back in 1785 that William Withering understood this. And he was giving prescriptions of foxglove to his patients who suffered from heart problems. But all of that was arrived at really through trial and error. Right? And then, of course, there are also the accidental discoveries. And the classic one is penicillin, where Alexander Fleming left a Petri dish with some bacteria over the weekend while he was away. And when he came back, he looked in his Petri dish and he saw a mold growing. But most people would have said, hell, you know, this thing went moldy. I better start his experiment over. But he looked at it carefully and he saw that around the periphery of the mold, the bacteria had died. That was the serendipitous discovery of penicillin, which of course turned out to be of, of uh, great importance. I mean, essentially helped turn the tide of the war because the allies had penicillin and the Germans did not. But it was a lucky discovery. So was Coumadin or warfarin, as you may know, which is the most widely used anticoagulant in the world. How was it discovered? It was discovered by a farmer noticing that his cows were bleeding to death after they had been eating moldy sweet clover. Well, it turned out that the chemical in that moldy sweet clover was dicumerol. That's the substance that is now used as coumadin, but it only forms in the clover when it is contaminated with a mold. The mold releases enzymes, and that converts the coumadin, which is naturally occurring in the sweet clover, the enzymes from the mold converted to dicumerol. That's how coumadin was discovered. So again, it's an accidental discovery. One of the classic ones is Viagra. Viagra was originally used as an anti-angina medication. That's how it was de de developed. But some men found that there was a side effect. <laughs> and uh, obviously that came in very handy for Pfizer. And uh, Viagra now is one of the most widely sold drugs in the world. <laughs> the first time that a drug was made on purpose synthetically believe it or not, it was pretty late in our history, in 1832. And that was chloral hydrate, a sleeping substance. And uh, that was made by Justus von Ludwig, famous German chemist, who combined chlorine and ethanol and found that uh, uh, a substance that he made, which came to be called chloral hydrate, caused drowsiness. And then this was put into use. It was manufactured as a sleeping aid. But uh, it got a lot of fame when Marilyn Monroe committed suicide uh, because she used chlorohydrate together with uh, barbiturates. And when you uh, ask this question of what was the first synthetic drug, which I told you the truth is that it was chlorohydrate, uh, people very often will say aspirin. That isn't exactly correct. It is true that aspirin is a synthetic drug. However, the starting material for it, when it was first made, came from salicin, from the bark of the willow tree. That salicin was broken down to salicylic acid, which then was converted to acetyl salicylic acid. So there was synthesis here, but the starting material came from uh, a natural source. So this is the kind of uh, drug that we would call semi-synthetic because you take something that already occurs and you uh, modify it. All right, so where does biotechnology come in? Well, I suppose this would be biotechnology too, because if you're taking the extract of the bark of a tree, that's a living species. So, but interesting story really starts with um, Paul Ehrlich, a German physician, uh, who is widely regarded as the father of immunology, although there are others on whom that title could be conferred, again, because there really is never just one father of, of anything. 
Uh, immunology is, is, of course, the study of the various protective mechanisms that the body has. The body recognizes foreign invaders, whether they be bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses, cancer cells, toxins, etc. All of these together we call antigens, and the body's immune system tries to fight against them. Now, at the time when Paul Ehrlich first began interested in pharmaceuticals, uh, there were all kinds of drugs that were being used in a, in a callous fashion. For example, mercury sulfide was being used to treat syphilis. Well, it does kill the bacterium responsible for syphilis, but also usually ends up killing the patient. You know, so this, this was, uh, you know, the joke usually was that it's an effective treatment uh, for the disease, but it side effect is that it kills the patient. Uh, mercury was used in all kinds of interesting ways on syphilitic patients. This device is, um, well, you can imagine what it is. It, it, it's an enema that uses uh, mercury. Uh, of course, it would not have been effective except to produce some toxicity. So anyway, of course, Ehrlich was suspicious of these, didn't like these things. So he wanted to kill the invader without killing the patient. And his idea was to find what he referred to as the magic bullet. That is to find some sort of chemical that would target the disease without causing any extra mischief. Now, by this time, the early 1900s, of course, they were very familiar with the germ theory of disease. And people like Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch had shown uh, that disease is caused by uh, bacteria and, and viruses. In fact, um, Robert Koch had isolated the bacterium that caused the disease known as uh, anthrax, uh, for which he received the uh, Nobel Prize for showing that this was a bacterial disease. Now, here's a very interesting biotechnology uh, connection. Emil von Behring trained under Koch. So he was, of course, familiar with the germ theory of disease. And the disease in which he got interested uh, was the one that was called the strangling angel of children. This was diphtheria. And the reason that it is called that is because the main symptom of diphtheria is that it feels that your throat is closing. This used to be a horrific disease of, of children. But Beric had an idea. Now, again, it's hard to know exactly how this came about, but came about from research that was done by a number of others. And what he discovered was that if you grew some of the diphtheria bacteria in the lab, they produce a toxin. And that toxin is what caused the symptoms of diphtheria. But if you took that toxin and injected it into a horse, the horse would then produce what in that time they called an antitoxin. Today we would say antibodies. And then if you harvested the serum of the horse, you could use that to treat someone who was suffering from diphtheria. And Bering and Ehrlich worked together to discover a method by which they injected the diphtheria toxin into the horse, let the horse generate the antibodies, they took the blood of the horse, they separated serum, and from that, they made the first diphtheria vaccine. And it worked. It saved millions of lives. And uh, for this, von Behring uh, received the first ever Nobel Prize in Medicine that was first granted in 1901. So that, of course, shows you how important this was historically. Paul Ehrlich won the Nobel Prize a few years later because he, in fact, then found the silver bullet, which was a drug called Salversan, which targeted the tuberculosis uh, uh, bacteria. 
But the discovery of this diphtheria vaccine was tremendously important because it saved numerous children from coming down with diphtheria. And of course, it is still used today. The DPT vaccine that you had and that your children had, the D in that stands for diphtheria. What's the P? Pertussis, which is whooping cough. And what's the T? Tetanus, right? So the DPT vaccine, which is given commonly to, to uh, uh, children, except you know, for the anti-vaxxers influencing some uh, parents not to vaccinate their children. I give you one final story here about biotechnology. And this deals with pain. Well, we already talked about opium, which is a natural pain reliever. Uh, of course, the trouble with opium is that it's also an addictive substance and people take it to induce euphoria. Wars have been fought over this. The British fought two wars called the Opium Wars with China because China didn't want the Chinese to get addicted to opium. The British did because they were making a lot of money selling opium in China. And that's what caused uh, the war. In any case, in 1916, Martin Freund and Edmund Speyer, this was in Frank Frankfurt, synthesized oxycodone. Now, this was a semi-synthetic substance because they took thebaine, which is actually found in the opium poppy. In the lab, they chemically manipulated it to convert it to oxycodone. The hope was that this would not be addictive. I mean, this is the holy grail of pain research, is to find a drug that takes away pain, that doesn't cause euphoria, and doesn't give you addiction. Oxycodone was widely used in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. In fact, Hitler was addicted to it. He was prescribed it by Dr. Theodore Morell, who had also prescribed amphetamines to him. Hitler was a walking pharmacy. And uh, uh, there's just no question about all the stuff that he was taking, including uh, oxycodone, to which he was uh, certainly addicted. But the interesting story here, uh, of course, revolves around the brothers Sackler, Raymond, Arthur, and Mortimer, who founded Purdue Pharma, which is a large, large pharmaceutical company. The product that they sold was morphine, but their invention was to coat the tablet in such a way that the morphine would be released slowly so that you didn't have to take it every four hours, it would last a longer time, which also meant that you had pain relief for a longer time and it seemed to be less addictive. So they were selling morphine sulfate, but then they had the idea uh, of eventually applying this notion of coating the pill to other drugs as well. So the first drug that they sold was uh, MS content, which was just morphine coated so that it would be released slowly. But when the patent on this was running out, which of course happens, you only get a patent for a certain number of years, then they decided to apply the same technology to OxyContin, which of course, as I told you, already had been manufactured in Germany. But where the Sacklers become kind of borderline criminals is that they started pushing this to doctors and their salespeople went into doctor's offices, told doctors that this was great drug because it would give pain relief for 12 hours so that patients would not wake up in the middle of the night and have to take their their morphine. Uh, Arthur Sackler was the brains behind this advertising stuff. He also was a collector of all kinds of things, and, and he was a philanthropist too. 
So he did have, you know, sort of a, a good side. But the bad side was that they pushed this idea that it was 12 hours of relief, that you would not have euphoria from it, and then less than 1% would become addicted. The fact is, this was an absolute lie, and they knew it to be so. Because there were many studies that had been done showing that, that indeed the percentage of addiction was higher than 1%. And that people were using this on the street for, uh, for euphoria. They were even counseling doctors that they should be prescribing oxycodone for backaches, wisdom teeth attack, headaches. This is ridiculous. Because this is a drug with, with addictive potential. You don't want to prescribe it in this callous fashion. And of course, we began to notice that, that people were getting withdrawal symptoms because they had been taking uh, the oxycodone. And not only that, they also discovered that you could grind up the tablets and then inject it to get a real high or to snort it like cocaine. And of course, we know the consequences of that. We have this, this huge opiate problem, right? Uh, Vancouver, for example, you know, so there's some streets in Vancouver where you really, really you literally see this. You see the, the, the addicts on, on, on the street. Mm -hmm. The company then, to try to circumvent this problem, made an adjustment and came up with Oxineo, which are tablets that you can't crush so that you can't eject it and you can't uh, swallow it. And of course, the company had a huge backlash, uh, you know, being portrayed as, you know, selling uh, death and all the people who died from uh, overdose. And eventually the government stepped in, the company was dissolved, the Sacklers paid 4.5 billion. Of course, they surely had squirreled over, over a lot of money in, you know, the, Caribbean banks or, or whatever. But they also, to their credit, they were great philanthropists. They did donate uh, a lot of money, but unfortunately they created a lot of uh, misery along, uh, along the way. This is portrayed in an uh, interesting series that you can watch on Netflix. It's, it's called Painkiller. And it tells a whole oxycodone story including you know how pretty young women were hired to approach doctors to convince them to take uh, to prescribe oxycodone uh, etc the story is quite well told i have a bit of issue with it because when you watch this you come away with the impression that oxycontin is some kind of a toxin should be banned should never be used well of course oxycontin doesn't make any decisions it's people who make decisions when used appropriately, it can be a very useful medication. I mean, chronic pain is horrific. When someone suffers from chronic pain, you gotta do something about it. And uh, OxyContin works well, but you have to use it under the right conditions for the right indication. But if you watch the series, it gives you the idea that this is a drug made in hell and that it should never be used, which is just not true. It should never be used for things like, you know, headaches and, and wisdom teeth removal, of course. But when someone suffers from chronic pain, it can be considered. And also what, uh, you know, isn't made clear in this series is that most of the opiate problem that we have, all the addiction, is not due to oxycodone. It's mostly due to fentanyl and due to heroin. I mean, oxycodone is is a, a player, but it, it's not the uh, major player. Uh, also, the way that the movie portrays it is that if you give a patient uh, OxyContin, they're gonna immediately get addicted. That's not how it works. Uh, the addiction potential is certainly more than 1%, the way that you know the Sackler ads portrayed. But it is not at all a case that you immediately get uh, get addicted. So there, there were uh, there is some misinformation in that that uh, series. But anyway, I think what one can indeed conclude that there is shame on the Sacklers because they did push this 
uh, the advertising was really uh, loaded with all kinds of uh, misinformation. And it really did lead to some cases of addiction, but it is not the player in the opiate crisis. Fentanyl and heroin are much bigger players. Okay, well, and uh, why uh, is this an example of biotechnology? Because as I told you in the beginning, uh, the way that oxycodone was made was by modifying a naturally occurring chemical that is found in poppy juice. And obviously that comes from a living system. So that's our story for today. And you can, I mean, I, I, I would alert you to watch, watch the series on Netflix. I mean, it's certainly worth uh, watching, but take it with a bit of a grain of salt. Yeah. I recently had surgery and they prescribed that. I looked at the, I looked at the description because this is what you're giving me. And the doctor would say it's a very it's an effective good drug used properly. So people right away, what are you, what are you giving me? You want to make me dramatic? And used properly, prescribed properly, does it does it see? So you don't have to if you're wise. Yes, I mean oxycontin works. <laughs> it works. Yeah. The drug is being sold. Is what? Yes, they they it. Yes. Oxycontin, of course. Yeah. Oh yeah, but it, oxycontin is generically available. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it advertised, but I haven't watched it yet. Is it? Is it good? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's often hard to tell the difference. Yeah. Where, where, where do you watch that? Uh, on TV, I forgot what uh, day it was. Uh, what happened? Okay, yeah, but yeah, I've been meaning to take a look at that. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take a look. Uh, two more big questions. I also saw a documentary where uh, the doctors were supposed to give up their names on, on uh, different uh, uh, places where they donated to universities. Yes. I don't know if it was the same documentary. Or yeah. No, there's the, the other one. The, the, there's two. On, uh, the, the other one is what is it called Dope. Uh, Something with dope in the title. Yeah, dope sick. Yeah. 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 Now, Kobe and Keith made the dog Bennett. So, Bennett, obviously, is not kosher for some reason. Well, Bennett comes from from a calf. So, how is Bennett? Uh, there's two ways that you can make cheese without rennet. There's acid curd cheese, where you just add some acid to the milk, and that will precipitate the, the casein. Uh, that's how fresh cheeses like cottage cheese are made. But you can also make the... Um, the enzymes in rennet for genetic engineering without having to use uh, a cow. So you can actually make rennet without a cow. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, there's this really two answers to that. One is the uh, rabbinical answer. <laughs> and many rabbis will tell you that that if a chemical has been processed to such an extent that you can't tell where it came from, then you can use it. So uh, rennet processing has a lot of steps. So that's one thing. And the other is, as I said, you can make it without an animal through recombinant DNA technology. So you can make rennet synthetically. Then there's no issue. I was up in the kitchen for about a little something.
with enough time to get around to it. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, the Ozempic story is, uh, of course, a very interesting and a very important story in many ways. It's interesting scientifically, it's interesting sociologically, and there's some scamming involved in it as well. Uh, one thing is for sure is that Ozempic, which belongs to a family of drugs called GLP-1 agonists, <laughs> works. It does cause weight loss. Uh, not nearly as impressive as the ads will tell you, but but there are you know people who can lose significant weight. But uh, the weight loss was actually uh, an accidental discovery because Ozempic was originally designed for diabetes, yeah. okay, which for which it works very well because it causes insulin uh, release. But then it was observed basically accidentally that people who were on Ozempic lost weight. And then of course, doctors were starting to prescribe it for that because once something is out on the market, you can prescribe it so-called off-label for whatever you, you want. So doctors started to prescribe it. And uh, now people noticed that it, it worked, but this really is for someone who's significantly overweight. I mean, if you know, you're know you more than 40 pounds overweight, that's when you consider it. It's not for the Hollywood starlet who wants to lose five pounds, you know. but unfortunately that's where it's being used. The side effects are, are not insignificant. Most people have nausea from it, which is recurrent. So it's not like you get used to it and, and, and it, uh, it goes away. Uh, so it's not the magic drug as it is being portrayed, but under proper conditions, you know, proper supervision for uh, people who are grossly overweight and who are diabetic, uh, it will reduce the risk of disease, you know, but it really has to be properly uh, monitored. And um, in, in Canada, yeah, it's expensive. So $1,200 a month. Is that like, is that like metformin? No, no, no. Totally different mechanism action from metformin. Metformin is way up. Well, what, what will be but, met, met, metformin basically just increases insulin release in, in your body. So it works. I mean, yeah. Uh, Ozempic supposedly works better than metformin. But there, there's no study that I've seen that directly compared metformin to Ozempic. So it's very expensive. In Canada, as you know, you are not allowed to advertise um, prescription drugs on TV. So they get around it in a very clever way, I must say, that you have to give them some credit for this. As I'm sure you've seen these ads where you know you just see two people talking and say, you're taking Ozempic? Yeah, my father's taking Ozempic. Go ask your doctor about Ozempic. That's okay, they can do that because they're not saying, they're not even saying that it's a drug. They're not saying anything about it. So that, you know, re it really is skirting the law. Uh, but uh, prescriptions certainly are being written a lot for... Uh, so to control weight loss, do the costs help pay the benefits? I, I would say that if you are overweight to the extent that there's a risk of heart disease, risk of diabetes, yes. It should never be the first line treatment. It's not the first thing you would attempt. You know, and generally people who eventually are successful with Ozempic are people who have tried everything else and have failed. What happens if you stop? What happens if you stop? The weight comes back. And this is this is another this is another issue with Ozempic, is that you're buying into it for a lifetime. And you're buying into a thousand dollars a month for a lifetime, unless you happen to have some sort of insurance coverage. Because there was an episode that on sixty minutes, I believe, and they were talking to part of the professor. Yeah. Uh, pronouncing the benefits of it, you know, that that's the way that the that the insurance company should be looking at it as uh, obesity is a disease. Yes. 
Well, I, I think some insurance companies, some insurance companies in the States do cover it if the doctor makes a case for it. It's on a case by case and business. Side effects to it, but that's not necessarily true. Right? Well, no, that's not true. If they said there's no side effects to it, that are absolutely not true. Because uh, not only the there, the house, yeah. Yes, there's also something else called uh, called uh, gastric paralysis, uh, which can be very dangerous. Uh, the problem is that that with Ozempic, uh, the reason that you lose weight is because you don't feel like eating, and the reason you don't feel like eating is because your stomach is full, because it doesn't pass from the stomach to the intestine quickly. So therefore you don't feel hungry. But that is a type of paralysis of the stomach and that can be very dangerous if it goes to extreme. So, yeah. It is not a magic bullet. We have a question from our Zoomers. Yeah. Uh, they're asking about the health benefits of the, these things like kimchi or buttermilk or right. sourdough. Yes, there, there, there are health benefits to all of the fermented foods because what happens is that uh, these bacteria, which are present in the fermented food, pass through to the colon. And there, uh, they produce what we call short-chain fatty acids. And those are absorbed into the bloodstream and they have been linked with lowered cholesterol, uh, reduced risk of diabetes. So there is there is something to the whole probiotic thing. Um, it reduces digestive problems. The only thing that you have to be careful with things like kimchi is the I kimchi want, particularly that yeah. happens to be high in salt, a lot of sodium in right. kimchi. Uh, yogurt, of course, is another one of these probiotics that has the beneficial bacteria. So yeah, I mean, fermented foods are... I, you know, I hesitate to say for any food healthy and unhealthy, because that's not how the body works. There are diets that are healthy, overall diets, and overall diets that are unhealthy. But you can eat all the fermented food that you want and still have a horrific diet, or never touch a fermented food and have a good diet, you know. So we have to look at the overall diet, but it certainly can include fermented foods, but, you know, pickles and sauerkraut and things like that, which are good, but you just got to be aware that they tend to be high in salt. All right, we'll see you next time.